This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And to want to give a special thank you to Jorge A. Rivera, Simon Young, Rebecca Baum, and to Alejandro J. Perez Gonzalez, who all just signed up this month to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 513 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And I want to give a special thank you to Tom Gerenser, who just gave the book a five-star review on Amazon.com. It says... I've never come across a writer who cares about perfection in science fiction and fantasy like David Barkertley does, or one who achieves it so consistently. The fact that we have so few stories from Dave is a testament to how hard he works on each one. This is a writer who comes up with exceptionally cool ideas, then works to find the perfect characters and situations to dramatize them, not resting until he's found an incredibly satisfying resolution to each one. These are stories you'll read over and over again. The artwork here is astounding, too and the thoughtful writer's notes that accompany each tale are fun and informative. The stories here are so inventive, original, and well thought out that any one of them would make an entertaining blockbuster movie. If you like science fiction and fantasy, I highly recommend buying this book. You'll be so glad you did. So big thanks again to Tom Gerenser for that great review. And our guest today is Alex Kurtzman. He's co-written some of the biggest Hollywood movies of the past 20 years including Mission Impossible 3, Transformers, Star Trek 2009, and The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And he's also been a writer and director for numerous TV shows, including Fringe, Lock and Key, and Clarice. He also oversees the current slate of Star Trek TV shows for Paramount+, Plus, including Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Picard, and Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And in this interview, we'll be discussing his new Showtime series, The Man Who Fell to Earth, which is based on the 1963 novel by Walter Tevis, and which serves as a sequel to the 1976 movie starring David Bowie. And now here's our interview with Alex Kurtzman. All right, so we're here with Alex Kurtzman. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so your new show is called The Man Who Fell to Earth. So how did the show come about? Um, Sarah Timberman, one of our fellow executive producers, uh, uh, was doing it at Hulu. And she brought it to me and Jenny and um, Jenny was very quick to dive in and say yes, without really knowing much, much more about it other than the film. I don't think at the, I'm not sure she had read the novel at the time. I was, I was more hesitant initially just because I think stepping into any territory related to David Bowie felt dangerous to me. Um, But at the same time, I think that Jenny and I, were really taken by the idea of getting to write a story about uh, how the ultimate outsider perceives us uh, as a species, you know, particularly at this very divisive and critical moment um, in our in our world. Uh, and it, it felt like a way to 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 do to write a very entertaining story and show, but also have something to say. So we we dove in. And Jenny is is Jenny Gumit. Um, and you guys have been working together for for years, right? Yeah, yeah. Jenny Jenny Lumet and we've been um, working together for man, uh, I mean, since about twenty. We started. We she started. We we started like working together in some capacity in twenty ten, but then really formally around twenty uh, twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen. Like, how did that happen? What like, what happened in twenty ten? Like, how did you meet her? <laughs> well, it's a funny story. I um. I went to see Rachel getting married, uh, which is her, was her first movie. And it just so, it struck me so profoundly um, as somebody that I knew. I just knew the voice of that movie so well, like it was someone from my own family. And um, 
I, I came out of the theater and I was like, I need to meet whoever wrote that. So I literally cold called her agent and said, you know, I don't know if she'd be interested in meeting me, but I'd love to sit down with her. And she was, and we did, and we instantly hit it off and um, started sort of, I was working on a screenplay at the time. She was working on a screenplay at the time. We started trading scripts back and forth, just giving each other notes on the scripts. And one thing kind of led to another and we realized our collaboration was really great and we started writing together. So could you say more like, what is your collaborative method and is there any sort sure. of division of labor or like what makes it work so well? You know, I think it's interesting. We both kind of do everything, but we do things very differently. Um, so when I think one of Jenny's sort of extraordinary gifts is that she writes incredible, incredible dialogue. She's just, she's just got this way of coming into a scene and hitting whatever the scene's supposed to be about in a way you don't expect. She'll just come at it from the left and you're not, you're not, and you always end up kind of surprised. I tend to be very focused on structure. And then what will happen is we'll spend lots of time uh, just talking, really talking broadly about what we want to do, what kind of story we want to tell, and what's the soul of the story. And, and then we start literally just tossing pages back and forth and back and forth. Um, And we'll stop and we'll talk as we go. And it builds from there. And we have, I mean, I think one of the things that is so fantastic about our partnership is we have so much fun together. We, we kind of laugh all day long, which is a, a good sign because they're, we're just, we're in a great energy and a great rhythm. We're very unprecious about things. Like if something isn't working, we both say it and it, it doesn't feel defensive or, you know, like it's, there's no confrontation. We just, start, we're, I think we're always looking for whatever the best version of it is. Um, and, uh, and we, we keep writing until they pry it out of our cold dead hair. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing is it kind of, we just like to keep iterating. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so so then you so you get this um, the man who fell to earth project, and mm-hmm. then did you know it was going to be a sequel, or did you think it was going to be a remake, or like how how did that work? No, we weren't interested in doing a remake um, because you know Nicholas Rogue and David Bowie, and then obviously Walter Tevis from the novel they 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 did their thing so specifically that it, it felt like to just remake that story would have not worked, but. I think what we wanted to do was honor the spirit of much of what they did, the work that they did in many ways, but ha- have a new story to tell. And it became pretty clear that we couldn't really tell the story without bringing in the character from the original. But if you look at Bowie's character in that film, he's very, very passive. You know, he arrives here as a wide eyed innocent and he ends up getting corrupted by alcohol and he is betrayed by the woman that he loves and the CIA takes everything that he's come here to build away from him. And he ends up at the end of the film, blind, alcoholic and alone. And the idea that we wanted to do was sort of say, okay, well, that was one character, but who would that character be 45 years later? He would not be the same person. What did all of those things what happened to him as a result of those things? You know, what does 45 years of alcoholism do to you? What, what is it, what does it do to you when you feel betrayed by love, when you know that the government sort of took away everything you came here to do? And so you can't, your planet will die. That probably metastasizes, metastasizes into something quite ugly and scary. And then suddenly he wasn't a passive character anymore because once Faraday arrives here to a Telechia Force character and has to deal with Thomas Newton and discovers that he is not at all the character that he thought he would be, not at all the character from the first film. Um, uh, you suddenly have a very unreliable narrator, and that was really interesting to us. Yeah, I thought uh, Chuyatel Ejiofor, he does such a great job of portraying this alien character. I mean, I, I watch him, and I don't think there's any special effects or uh, uh, makeup or anything in some of these scenes, And I just, but I just feel like I'm watching uh, an amphibian, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, what, what sort of um, like conversations did you have about how you were going to make this character seem so alien? We had, you know, we had great, um, very long in depth conversations about it. A lot of it was built. It was on the, a lot of it was on the page. A lot of the behavior was on the page, but Chuatel is such a fine and such a precise actor. And the first thing that he did, which was remarkably right, was to say, I think I need to understand how I moved on Anthea in order to understand how I would move here. And really what he meant by that was that 
gravity was different on his planet. So once you come to a planet where the gravity is heavier, you're going to carry your physicality in a, in a completely different way. And um, there's a, a woman named Coral Messam who we worked with very closely, who Chuatel had been in a play with in, in London. Um, and Coral is a choreographer and she choreographed Steve McQueen's small acts uh, episode, Lover's Rock. And um, she came in and worked with me and worked with Chuatel and, and we developed a physicality to the Anthians and the way they moved. And because we, we came up with the idea that the, their planet itself was so loud um, just the, the winds and everything that was going on and the destruction of the planet was so loud that they evolved away from communicating verbally and that they had to communicate non-verbally because you'd have to communicate through layers of dust with each other uh, and so much noise. And that ended up uh, building this entire language, uh, sign language that they used to communicate, uh, 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 like a very particular way of moving together. Um, so that was just a process of lots and lots of rehearsals and you know, we would get together and 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 I would watch Coral talk Chuatel through all these different movement exercises and, and learned a lot from from her. You know, in a, a couple of weeks ago, we reviewed um, Starman, the movie from the 80s. Uh-huh, sure. And, um, you know, in Jeff Bridges, he talked about how he he sort of modeled his movement on, I think, he, like his daughter was a toddler at the time or something. And so mm. he's like, oh, a, a character who... You know, I wanted to to mimic that, you know, a, a person who's still learning to control sure. their body. Because, and I was just wondering if if Starman was something that you looked at at all in in terms of uh, how to how to do that sort of new alien alien who's new to being human. You know, I didn't I didn't look at Starman this time. I loved Starman when I was a kid. I saw it many times in the theater, so I know it really well. And um, Starman is a really touching and really moving film. Um, and there's something very honest about Jeff Bridges performance in there. Um, and, and something very grounded about John Carpenter's direction. And it's just, and he wrote the score too. It's just a, it's a great film. Um, and, but I, I think part, maybe part of it is that I just didn't want to, um, I didn't want to be imitating anybody else. You know, I didn't want to be imitating what other, uh, what other directors had done or what other stories had done. I, I think we wanted to find our own language for it. The one person I will say I think was deep in the DNA of it for both me and Jenny was Buster Keaton. Um, Buster Keaton and the way Buster Keaton moved and the kind of, you know, they called Buster Keaton the great stone face. He was so stoic (laughs) all the time. And the idea that he would kind of move in these ways that the human body shouldn't actually be able to move in, but he would do it with no expression on his face was a really, that was a great marker for us. Um, And then weirdly, it was so strange after we had finished shooting, um, I found a set of photographs that had been taken on the set of the man who fell to earth, the original film. And Bowie is sitting in his trailer, holding up uh, an autobiography of Buster Keaton with the big picture oh, wow. of Buster Keaton's face on it. And he's mimicking Buster Keaton's face side by side. And I thought, man, we hadn't even seen that. And somehow osmotically <laughs> we, we like got that off of his performance, which was incredible. How about all this stuff? Like, I, I I have seen the Bowie movie. I haven't read the Walter Tevis novel, but there's this stuff in the show about how he, you know, he's always drinking massive amounts of water. And you yeah. know, he says at one point that he has four stomachs and sort of gouts water in one scene. Like, is all that stuff about the the massive quantities of water inside his body, is that something you came up with or is that um, in one of the earlier iterations? Well, no, it's really just a riff off of what they did in the novel and in the film because he comes to earth for water because his water, because his planet is, is totally starved of water. There's, there, there isn't any in existence. And in fact, he, he, in the, in a kind of amorphous, unclear way, his mission is to transport water back to Anthea in the novel and in the film. And I think that we took the spirit of that idea and interpreted it in our own way that if you came from a planet with no water, but you know, you needed water. If suddenly water was in abundance everywhere, you'd probably want to drink it all the time because you don't <laughs> take it for granted. So anywhere he sees it, he wants it. There's a there's a moment, a very interesting moment in the film, early in the film after Bowie visits the pawn shop, which we sort of riffed on our own version of um, in the pilot, where he goes to like there's almost like su- it, it almost looks like sewage water that's coming out of a of a stream, um, and Bowie goes and drinks it, and and I, I think that may be of part of what influenced us. Could you talk like do you remember that there's a scene where in I think it's in episode one where where the alien he sort of has stuck this hose 
way, way down his <laughs> yeah. throat. Do you yeah. remember the moment where you came up with that scene? Um, you know, that was one of those like very weird. I think Jenny and I, especially on this show, are, are always looking for like, what's the weirdest thing we can do in this scene? <laughs> um, I'm, and I think that was a Jenny Lumet special where like I suddenly, you know, we had de- I got a, a version back one day and he had suddenly stuck like a 12 foot garden hose down his throat. And um, I was like, this is great. I have no idea how we're going to shoot it, but I, we're doing this. Oh, so was it a challenge to shoot shoot that scene? Um, we shot that scene in a night, that entire sequence. And the 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 way we did it was he he picked up the hose, all the stuff you're seeing where he's like putting it toward his mouth, that's all real. And then the hose that gets pulled out of his mouth is a CG hose. So the actors are actually miming we, we, what we did was I threw the hose over Chuatel's left shoulder and had the actor who's playing the, um, the, the police officer pulling the hose so that there was a, an actually a real hose to, to pull from. And then we removed it in CG and changed the direction of the hose so, and put it into his mouth so that it looked like it was actually coming out of his mouth. Hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Um, it's actually funny speaking of the, the water and the amphibian and stuff, you know, when I studied screenwriting, they talked a lot about writing stories that were a fish out of water, you know, where there's a character who is, is, you know, not used to this environment and and makes mistakes. And it occurred to me that this is kind of like a literal fish out of water. Did you Mm -hmm. ever, and if that, did you ever think about that? Um, in a way, I mean, they're called amphians. And so it's, it's, I think, which maybe, you know, that's a Walter Tevis thing. So maybe he was riffing off of just the word amphibian in some way. Um, but yes, I, I think, you know, there's no doubt that in our story, it's a little different in the, in the film because you see the, you see Bowie's ship crash, but then the next, the first time you see him, he's kind of coming over a hill fully dressed. And one of the, you know, when I saw that, my first thought was where did he get all the clothes? Like, did he arrive in that <laughs> David Bowie trench coat and pants um, and sunglasses? And so I thought, no, no, we got to see him get all that, right? And in fact, not only that, where did he get his skin? Um, and suddenly you're into some really interesting questions. And that's what that's what prompted that whole kind of birth, birthing scene, you know, as if he's, you know, emerging from the, the depths and, you know, his skin is kind of wrapping around him and, uh, and, and he crawls up onto land. Uh, and I guess that would be a good amphibian metaphor. <laughs> well, right, because in the Bowie movie, I mean, he already speaks and he has a British accent and sort of knows his way around, and and so you 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 take it much more that he's like a like a newborn babe who kind of has yeah. to figure everything out. Yeah, very much so. And you know, going back to your point about Starman, you know, there's that lovely scene at the beginning where you see the Starman come into Karen Allen's house and and see the photograph of Jeff Bridges, who's obviously was deceased in the photograph, and um and he kind of learns everything very quickly. Um, and I, and I, I think that we really liked the idea of Faraday having a sense of, of language, but it's one thing to understand it when you hear it on satellites is another thing entirely to have to generate it. So the, that those opening scenes are he's, he's first just imitating and his brain is processing, but once he gets to the police precinct, he, you know, he learns language by listening to it in about five minutes. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really cool the way you did it. Um, let's talk about some of these other characters. So like two of the other main characters are Justin and Hatch. So yep. kind of how did you come up with those characters? Well, Justin is very much the audience. You know, we knew that, um, Faraday as a character would be a, a particular thing for the audience. Um, but you needed a character who, who we could relate to very quickly, uh, who would be reacting to Faraday the way that the audience would be reacting to Faraday. And, um, you know, Naomi Harris, who is just an extraordinary, extraordinary talent, um, leads with this sort of spontane- spontaneity and empathy. And she's just so, so present in her performance. And I, I think we just loved the idea that here's this woman, this black woman, who is literally a once in a generation mind um, and could has the potential in her to change the world, literally change the world. But her, the way what she saw was ahead of its time that the technology didn't necessarily exist to actualize this incredible vision that she had in her head. And as you'll see in later episodes, there was a real consequence to her for her to, to pursuing it. And so because of a tragedy that, that happened to her, she really has locked herself down, 
when you meet her. She's on autopilot. She's shut down. She's just trying to survive. She's she's just trying to get enough money to to be able to get her daughter through daycare and to to make sure that her father, who's got a, a disease and is very close to death, can survive for as long as possible. And little does she know that this being from another planet shows up to say that, oh, yeah, that thing that you came up with that isn't actually physically possible here on this planet, not only were you right, but I know a way to make it physically possible. And so she now she has to figure out a way to d- decide if she's going to overcome all the personal demons that she has and and, and join this mission. And I, th- I think we felt like it was just an incredibly relatable character and story. And as for Hatch, uh, Rob Delaney's character, you know, each character in a funny way is like our riff on a paradigm that was set up in this in the film. So Buck Henry's character, um, Farnsworth, is is a character from the film. Is like Hatch is like the our version of, of uh, sort of a tip of the hat to, to that. Um, you know, the character who is this incredible genius who can help the alien actualize his vision, um, but s- sort of sees the chessboard like a like an incredible player. And sees where all the loopholes and all the problems are and all the dangers and helps him navigate around it. And also, you know, all the characters have some kind of real ob- internal obstacle that they have to overcome. And even the, even the smaller characters on the show, Jenny and John and I and the entire writing staff worked really hard to give everybody an arc so that you really felt that they had gone somewhere from the beginning to the end. Is that when you when you talk about you know like Justin being a once in a lifetime mind and stuff and and Hatch is this financial whiz is that uh, challenging to write characters who are so have such high level specialized knowledge? Um, you do a lot of we actually talked you have to do a lot of research to do that right. So like as far as Justin goes, there was a, a really fantastic physicist named Melanie Winridge Winbridge who we worked with in um, in London um, and. Uh, there was a lot of research that I did with people here. Um, we actually had somebody, one of the writers in the room um, was also uh, has a, had a deep science background. So he would kind of give us some baseline ideas for things. And then, um, and then as, so, so that was, a, we built a lot of what Faraday came here to do and a lot of Justin's history uh, on that. Um, and then for Hatch, you know, Hatch, that ability to to be sort of a to hedge against chaos to 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 be sort of the person who can see the chessboard. Um, there were a bunch of people that we worked with along the way to help bolster that. But a lot of it is knowing what to look for and kind of what you want dramatically, and then figuring out a way to gather information correctly so that you can write the character authentically. And they end up informing each other. You know, you have one idea of what you want to do dramatically, but suddenly a piece of information comes that's real, and you go, oh. Well, if that's real, I actually want to, I want to start pivoting the character in that direction or a skill set in that direction, because that what's real is always what's more interesting. And I think obviously is more authentic to people. Could, could you think of an example of something like that that came along that was real where you're like, oh, we got to work that into the story? Yeah, like um, the, the idea that Hatch is, a, is, a, is, a, is somebody who specifically has the skill set to hedge against chaos is actually a, that there, there are people who do that job. And when we started writing Hatch, we were thinking like, is he an attorney? But it, it was actually talking after talking to people who do that for a living that we kind of went, oh, that that's a really specific and unique job. And he should, that's what we should have him do. We just hadn't seen that on screen before that way. Well, because there's this great scene where, you know, because um, Faraday, he has this, it's described as a quantum fusion generator that mm-hmm. fits in your pocket. Uh, that'll basically, you know, provide limitless clean energy, basically. Yeah. And you would think that this is 100% a good thing. But then Hatch looks at this and sees all the downsides of, yeah. you know, everyone who works in the oil and gas industry is going to be unemployed overnight. And it's going to have this cascade of yep. ca- of catastrophes. Like. Yeah. So yeah. is, is that something, did one of these experts like go on a rant like that or where did that Yeah, in from? fact, so I, 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 we worked with a, um, a consultant named Walter O'Brien. And one of the questions I asked was, okay, so tell me, you know, give me your, your riff on what happens globally. If something like cold quantum fusion were to just appear one day. 
And everything that Hatch says there came from Walter. <laughs> uh, what are the odds that quantum fusion will appear someday? Well, it's interesting because while we were in production, they started making lots of steps toward success with cold fusion. Um, and I, I keep reading about it over and over. Like if you Google it, you'll see that the process of creating fusion, um, th like they have these super colliders that, that do it. Um, it's very, obviously, it's more complicated than I could possibly explain, but um, it does feel like we're inching closer to something. I mean, I know that a lot of people are, you know, whoever cracks that is is going to change the way that the global economy works. And not just the global economy, but just that's clean energy. You know, that means that with tap water, you can actually create energy. Now, is that is it possible? Yes. Do we have the means to do it right now? No. But are people are scientists working on it? They are. Right. So this thing about powering Buckingham Palace for a year on yes. less than a gallon of water, that would that's that's the real It's theoret yes, it's theoretically possible. It's theoretically possible. I'm not saying it's currently possible, but it's theoretically possible. Yeah. Um, there was a line that really jumped out at me where um, Justin is talking about how her obsessive focus on her work was destructive to others. And Faraday says, if you destroyed nothing, you would have accomplished nothing. Yeah. Could you, could you talk about that? Yeah. Um, you have to break a system down in order to rebuild something new, right? Which is part of it's in a way it's, it's to your point about what Hatch is saying. It's the same thing, you know? Our world right now is currently entirely dependent on gas, coal, electric. But if you started changing that system, everything would break down, right? And there would be chaos for a period of time, but what, what would emerge would be something new. And so what he's saying is you can't really create and rebuild without some form of destruction. It's just the nature of, it's the nature of nature. You know, it's the way our planet works. It's the way our seasons work. So her, you know, she's in her mind, she's thinking, I did, I did something bad. And what he's, what, and what he's sort of saying to her and what he says to her, but you'll see a lot more of the story by the end of episode four is that your, your perspective is skewed. You're not seeing it correctly. You think you failed, but in fact, had you not done that, you would have succeeded. And in fact, the fact that the damage that was done was so limited is in some ways a miracle. I mean, kind of what it made me think of, because we see in the in the opening, there's sort of a, a flash forward in time that a frame story that opens the the series, and we see that Faraday has become a sort of tech uh, tech CEO or something. Yeah, and there are all these real I won't mention any names, but there are all these real tech CEOs who you know have accomplished all these great things, but also sort of left this like wake of devastation yep. around them and all the people that they knew. Yep, and it's it's kind of this question of you know. Like, could they have accomplished the things that they did if they had always been nice to everybody around them? Or is there some, yeah. you know, in, inextricable link between those two things? I mean, the common denominator with everybody who's, you know, the, all of those people are defined by an obsessive need to close the gulf between what they have in their mind and the reality of it actually coming to exist. And they won't stop until that happens. And when you are driven by that kind of obsession to see something realized that doesn't exist, you're going to leave bodies in your wake. There's just no way around it. Uh, it's it, it because that kind of change and damage is too massive not to. Um, and I don't mean literal bodies. I mean, although maybe, but <laughs> met metaphoric bodies, let's say. Um, the thing about that flashback structure is that, you know, just because he's on the stage, and telling the story from the future doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't going to be a problem once he gets to that stage. Right. Um, and as if you, you'll see, as we come to it later on, that um, many things are conspiring to, to get him off that stage as fast as possible. Okay. Yeah. I'm definitely looking forward. I've seen the first four episodes and I don't mm -hmm. know anything that happens after that. So yeah, I'm yeah. definitely curious to see. So I don't know how he gets to the stage yet. So yeah, yeah, if, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but, but this idea of, you know, if you destroyed nothing, you would have accomplished nothing. I, I listened to another interview with you and you said um, 
You said, I tend to subscribe to the point of view that you learn nothing from your successes and you learn everything from your failures. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I think it's true. I think, you know, if you look at history, I I'm always amazed at, at the, you know, the amount, the, the people, all the people who did great things and changed the world typically were coming from a place of having failed. And the thing about failure is that, you know, it's painful and it's humbling and it gives you a massive perspective on your life. But again, and this is clearly becoming the theme of this particular podcast, you end up rebuilding from it if you can survive it. And the thing that you end up rebuilding can be so much better than you could have imagined had you not had that failure. So, you know, I think that that's, that is generally true. I also think no one is immune to failure. It, everybody is going to do it at some, get there at some point, whether they like it or not. Um, and, you know, it's a question of how you carry it. You know, it can either break you or it can make you stronger. Um, and uh, that makes for interesting storytelling. I mean, I have this conversation with my girlfriend a lot because she's in an MFA program right now and she'll go in for these workshops and she'll come back and she's really happy because she's like, oh, everybody liked my story, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I'm kind of like, well, you don't really learn anything if everybody likes your story, right? Like it would be more of a learning experience if, you know, people hadn't, I mean, you, obviously as a writer, you want to show your work to people and have them be like, oh, this is so great. Sure. But if they, if they criticize you, then you're, you're actually getting more out of that than, than if they just say, oh, this is great all the time. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it, you know, obviously it feels great when somebody loves your work and it's very painful when somebody doesn't, but I guess the art of it is figuring out how, what, what of the criticism feels right to you? You know, some, some people hate just to hate and that is what it is. And that's not particularly helpful, but if if someone isn't being reached by the work that you're doing for a particular reason and can articulate why and say like you know your intention may have been x but what i but i didn't feel that well that's valuable right that that's actually valuable information because there's a saying that the audience is never wrong and i think what that really means is that like at the end of the day they're either going to feel what you're doing or they're not you know um it's like a, it's like telling a joke. If I have to, t if I tell you a joke and then have to explain to you why it's funny afterwards, it's not funny, you know? <laughs> and I, I think that there's the, the trick of it is, is figuring out a way to take the criticism, not have it break you, have, have, have it educate you a little bit, um, be open enough to ask like, okay, well, what am I missing? If, if my intention is for you to feel something that you're not feeling, then why are you not feeling it? And what, then what can I do to get you there? You know, and that's great. You know, that's very helpful. I'm not saying it's comfortable. It's almost never comfortable. But unfortunately, in my experience, it, it is it is sort of the fastest way to grow. I mean, sort of my experience having done a lot of writing workshops is very often if a lot of people are telling you something doesn't work, a lot of people will tell you something doesn't work and then how you should fix it. Mm -hmm. And they're almost always right that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And they're almost always wrong or very often wrong about how you should fix it. But it's it's more important. You know, it's more useful that, okay, this isn't working. They're diagnosing this thing that isn't working. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily need to do make the changes that they're saying, but I need to make some sort of changes. Yeah, Dave, that's exactly right. I mean, the, you know, the, the way we, we call it the note behind the note, you know, what's the note behind the note? Meaning somebody says, you know, I think you, uh, you know, I think the solution to your problem, you have a problem with your script or your problem with your story. And I think the solution is X and you, you hear that and you're like, that's definitely not the solution. That's sure. not, that's not what I want to do. Right. But again, it goes back to like, they weren't feeling what you wanted them to feel. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, what is the note? What are they really saying? Because sometimes they can't even, people can't even fully articulate why something isn't working for them, you know? And then I think it becomes the responsibility of the writer to ask questions and, and just to probe a little bit deeper to get to the root of what isn't landing. And once you've done that, then it becomes your job to say, all right, you know, maybe someone will come along every once in a while and miraculously give you the perfect solution. It's very unlikely, right? And in a, in a way, your ability to hear that criticism and then come up with a solution that suits you is the thing that will define your voice because 
it came from you, you know, and it probably wouldn't have, you probably wouldn't have gotten there without some friction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's one other character I want to make sure we mention who's, um, his name is Spencer Clay. Could you talk about yeah, how that sure. character came about? Sure. So, um, in the film, and in the not well, in the film, there's a you know the, the CIA is a kind of presence, um, and the CIA is there to destroy Faraday's life and destroy the company. And before I knew what exactly we were writing about, and I was like, I don't know, I'm not sure where the story is here. The one thing I did know was that oh, if the CIA is in it, then you know there's a there's a there's going to be an engine of some kind, right? I I can tell you generally who the you know the, I see that there's an antagonist. So that's the good news. The bad news is, including Starman, how many alien comes to Earth and then the government tries to grab them stories can you tell, you know, in a, and particularly in an original way. And we knew we needed the character, but I just what I think what Jenny and I didn't want was to be writing this sort of hopefully beautiful character story. And then suddenly you feel like when you cut to the CIA, you're in the born identity, you know, like it, there would just be massive tonal dissonance there. It just wouldn't feel right. And so we were like, well, how do we do this? And the, I think the way you, you know, oftentimes the way to solve a problem like that is you say, okay, forget about the fact that they're in the CIA. Who are they? What makes them interesting and compelling? And we came to this idea that what if he's just literally the meanest man in the world? What if he's just, both a total sadist and a total masochist all at the same time. And that led us to the scene with the waitress, um, you know, and what I, what I love about it, but I, I really like it as much as it's in the writing, it, this is such a tribute to Jimmy Simpson, who is an unbelievably brilliant guy that you're watching that scene and you're like, Oh, he seems kind of nice. Like he you know, <laughs> been kind of gently, gently asking her for, and then you kind of, it, it, the scene does what my favorite scenes do, which is like, Oh wait a minute! Wait, no, something's turning now. Like this isn't this isn't at all what I thought it was. And then by the end of the scene, you're in a completely different scene, and it's really not what you thought it was. And the getting to write those kinds of scenes is a total privilege for a writer because you know you have to start in one place and end up in a very different place. Um, and the idea that our antagonist had a personal obsession with Faraday. Uh, which we're going to learn a whole lot more about over the course of the season. But the idea that he has this kind of personal obsession that, that Faraday represents something to him that he is trying both to attain and to destroy became really compelling, you know, and suddenly you're not writing a, a guy in the CIA, you're writing about obsession um, and what it can do to you. And, and that was really interesting to us. So Spencer Clay is, you know, the, you know, obviously the antagonist. Um, and, and yet uh, hopefully his story just as a character, like all the other characters is going to be really, really interesting from beginning to end on its own. Well, I, I completely agree with you about how important the casting of Jimmy Simpson is because yeah, this, this character is clearly not very nice, but there's just something about Jimmy Simpson that makes him relatable and vulnerable. That's right. Just, yeah. I mean, what's so funny is like Jimmy is literally the nicest person on the planet. He is so lovely and he's so fun to work with. And he's just like he digs in so deep and he's such a great partner. I mean, I just like I can't say enough. I mean, the whole cast, every single person on the cast was a, an unbelievable delight to work with. And, you know, Jimmy had to go to some really dark places in this story and he did it he just dove in, you know, he really dove in, but I think you're right that there's like, there's a very um, compelling vulnerability about Jimmy um, that we also knew was going to make Spencer Clay unique because despite doing all these really terrible things, you're kind of like, that's a broken child and you feel it. He's like a broken child. And, you know, and there's also the mystery of why is he a broken child? Just like there's the mystery of what happened to Justin, just like there's the mystery of what happened to Hatch. You know, every character has a mystery around them. And the show very slowly unpacks what's going on with each, with each person, um, which, which I think for me is always what I love when I'm watching television, you know, especially in like 10 episodes where you get to go, oh, I, 
I get to take my time to like think one thing's going on, but then reveal another thing's going on. And just when I think I know what that is, it goes in another direction. And that, that was a really fun thing to do. I mean, was it a thing where you dreamed up this Spencer Clay character and immediately said, this has got to be Jimmy Simpson? Or did yeah. you like flail around for a while? No. And you're like, oh, it's, this is the guy. It was weirdly once we started writing it and I had never worked with Jimmy before, but I saw, you know, I saw him on Westworld and House of Cards. Um, and I, I had a really strong sense of his sort of his presence. And, you know, Jenny and I instantly were like, he would be so perfect. And so when we sent him the script, he he dove in right away. It, we were very lucky. I mean, I really recognize him from the um, the Star Trek Black Mirror episode. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Not of course. Totally. I was just I was just curious since you're such a big Star Trek guy. Yeah. What was your response to that? I loved that it. Episode? I thought it was totally brilliant. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> it was just brilliant. What did you think? Do you have any feelings about the like Star Trek fan being this sort of um, sinister weirdo? Um, I, you know, I think that it's, there's something interesting about what it says about fandom in general, you know, not just for Star Trek, but fandom in general, right? Like fa fandom of any kind is a place, particularly in, I think for, in our childhoods where w we escape to create an alternate reality for ourselves if our realities aren't quite what we want them to be. And, you know, that's why things like Star Trek or Marvel or, you know, I mean, pick your Star Wars, pick it, you know, that's why people have such deep um, personal reactions because there's something very personal about you, one's connection to a, to a franchise that speak to like, this is where I felt safe when I was a kid, you know? And I think that's, I guess there's an inherent darkness to it, even though it's also a wonderful, amazing thing. And there's so much light to it as well. So I guess that's just like a, it, it was kind of a perspective about like <laughs> what happens when it goes very, very wrong. But I don't think it's, I don't think that it's an inherently dark thing to be a fan. I, I mean, I, I consider myself a fan of many, many things, and uh, it isn't necessarily uh, characterized by darkness. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved the USS Callister episode, I, I, but I feel like I have less of a chip on my shoulder now than I did when, you know, like the scars of high school were were yeah. fresher, you know. But of I mean, but but I mean, part of the reason that we, um, you know, started this podcast was because we we watched like there's this documentary Trekkies where it's kind of like sure. oh, Star Trek fans are so weird, you know. Yeah. And we wanted to do something where it's like, no, like science fiction fans can be like cool and absolutely you know, and stuff. I think, um, I think what people don't really, I feel like this is maybe hopefully starting to change, but you know, if you're a science fiction fan that you, then you know that science fiction is never really about the future, right? It's always a, like a, a, a beautiful way of writing about the present. And that's what all the great science fiction minds have always done is they're interpreting their present through the genre of science fiction. And I think that's an incredibly um, important thing, right? Science fiction can be sort of marginalized in some ways, but it's talking about some of the biggest universal truths in our world, who we are as a species, where we're going as a species, what we're capable of in the best ways and in the worst ways. I mean, in that way, I think science fiction is really profound. And only recently is it starting to be taken more seriously. Like there's, there's this weird like snobbery around it, you know, where in the same way that there used to be snobbery about fantasy until Lord of the Rings and, and Game of Thrones totally changed that. Um, and I, my great hope for science fiction is that that stops because, you know, I just think it's some of the most incredible storytelling in the history of storytelling. Yeah, I, I certainly think so. And I, I hope this podcast is uh, hoping to change that in some small way. Well, I I, um, I, mean, I support it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, one thing I was really curious to ask, you know, one of my friends is Julia Galef. She's um, really active in the rationalist community. And she has this talk she gave that got a lot of attention called um, The Straw of Vulcan. Have you heard of Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. So it's basically, um, you know, it's like this instead of the straw man, it's the straw Vulcan. 
because the idea is that you have characters like Spock and they are supposedly, you know, they supposedly embody uh, logic and reason and stuff. But then if you actually look at their behavior in, in the TV show, they often do things that like don't really make any sense or mm-hmm. kind of dumb or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of gives people this idea that logic and it's sort of, um, you know, that it makes logic and reason seem less formidable than they actually are. Interesting. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, you should definitely go, um, go go watch the the talk because it's uh, it's it's really, in addition to being really smart, it's really funny. I definitely um, will. That sounds awesome. Thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah, and also, I mean, every everyone I've interviewed um, about Star Trek, like Will Wheaton or um, Brent Spiner and stuff, I always I always give them this idea, which so and, and I'm like, okay, I gotta I gotta tell you while I've got you. <laughs> but so so you always have um, you know, like we have characters with with like Spock or Data where they're sort of robotic or rational and then they have to learn to get in touch with their you know emotional sure. side and stuff and i think it would be cool if there was a character who was really headstrong and impulsive you know like like the kirk character from star trek 2009 uh-huh. and then he had to like learn to be more like a vulcan and so the the whole his whole character arc was like learning to control his emotions and learning about uh you know logical fallacies and cognitive biases and stuff like that so that's cool. Just putting, just, just putting it out there. That's very but, interesting. I mean, in a funny way, as you're describing it, it feels like that was kind of Luke Skywalker's journey. You know, he starts as this very impulsive farm boy. It was just all emotion. And by the time you see him in Jedi, you're like, that's a Vulcan that just walked in. The <laughs> you know, like it's a it's a really interesting like shift. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think that's a cool idea. I think it's a really, really cool idea. I'll take that to the writer's room. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because... Uh... Yeah, I mentioned it every time we talk about Star Trek on the show. I, I mentioned that, so that's cool. That's what I, um, let's see, we're almost out of time. Um, I did. You know, it was interesting. You know, I I watched uh, the original movie, the the Man Who Fell to Earth, and then I was just kind of doing research on it, and there was like some really interesting stuff. I don't know how much you dug into it, but like, um, did you know that David Bowie took four hundred books with him to the set? Because he didn't want anyone stealing them while he was gone. I didn't. <laughs> That's amazing. And did he read all of them or did he just hold on to them? I don't know. I mean, I assume he was kind of... Bi- it was interesting reading this Wikipedia article because David Bowie says like, oh, I was like so coked out of my mind during that movie. I had I have no idea what was going on. You know, I was just being myself. And then uh, his co-star says like, no, no, like he promised he wouldn't do any drugs and he didn't. So it's like this weird, I don't know. Like, I saw that too. I did see that. Yeah. I mean, I had heard all the rumors, you know, that he was living on, you know, 10 grams of Coke and milk while he was making it. And then I saw, I think it was Candy Clark who said like, no, no, he was very well behaved. And Nicholas Rogue had been very clear with him. Like, there's not going to be any drugs on my set. I, I you know, hit, we, we need a time machine to go back and know what really happened. But I heard that I saw those same things. Yeah. So I wasn't sure. I was wondering if you knew what to, is it like, if you're a rock star, you just kind of have to like project this myth about yourself and so you have to kind of like tell stories that are gonna gonna grow over time and stuff i don't know i mean it's you know it's really interesting like i there was a day a couple days where i would just do these really deep dives into bowie like just videos of bowie right i don't mean music videos i mean like interviews and it's so funny because i think like there's an interview with bowie on i think it was on dick cavett who was a who was a talk show host and you forget that like back in the day, if you were on a talk show, you were, you were talking for like 45 minutes. It wasn't like, you know, here's the five minute window you have between all the other things that now kind of exist. It was like a deep, long conversation with multiple commercial breaks. And you see as a young man that he's like, first of all, he's totally fearless. Like he's unbelievably fearless and, you know, has a, has both a confidence and an insecurity that are really quite extraordinary, right? He's pushing every boundary there is, but you can see that there's an incredible vulnerability in the, in, in his, in who he is. And then you, you go into the, like the middle phase of his career and he's definitely calmed down more and he's still like very unafraid to say the thing that needs to get said and to provoke And then by the time you get into his older years, he's very like, there's a, there's the wisdom that comes with age and a life lived the way that only David Bowie could live his life. Um, And so I don't know. I mean, you know, I like to think that he was defined by bravery 
you know, like his ability to reinvent himself and the different characters and the, and the music that he told and the, 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 just the sheer um, ambition that he had to be all the different versions of David Bowie that we've seen over so much time is, is an incredible thing. You know, it's, it's like what drives a person to be that you'll never really know. But what I can tell you is he made many, many, many generations feel big things and look at themselves, you know, and he was fearless. And so I think we tried as much as we could in this to be fearless in the storytelling because that's what he would have wanted. And I think that's what he would have done. So hopefully we got, you know, some small fraction of what he brought to the universe. What you were just saying about talk shows was reminding me of when I interviewed John Hodgman, I was, we were talking about this, about how, you know, on the Dick Cavett show, you used to have like Norman Mailer and people like that. Yeah. And, you know, and that kind of went away. But then he was saying, well, like podcasts have kind of brought it back. You know, totally. it's like if you go on Joe Rogan, it's like you're there for a three hour, you know, yeah. you're committing to sit down for three hours. You know, it's uh, it's a completely different thing than than the TV talk shows kind of turned into. It's so true. I mean, this conversation we're having right now is much longer than my my the interviews that I usually do. And it's nice because you get to go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Although we are, we are almost out of time. Um, let's see. I guess I'll, I'll ask you um, one of the other things on, that I just saw on Wikipedia, but it said, and I never knew this, and I'm a big Philip K. Dick fan, but I never read Vallis. But apparently in Vallis, um, it's about, you know, the characters are obsessed with this, this movie in which there's a, a, a musician is the main character. And this was actually, you know, based on Philip K. Dick and his friends becoming obsessed with the man who fell to earth. Oh, wow. So. Wow. That's, I didn't know that either. That's amazing. Yeah. So now it makes me really want to read Vallis. Um, I'm, I'm going to read it this weekend. You're getting <laughs> lots and lots of homework. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I was curious. I mean, are you a Philip K. Dick fan or are there other, are there other um, science fiction authors that you, that you really like? Yeah. I, Heinlein was the first, I think that, I think that was a, he was the first author when I was very young that I started reading. Um, there was a, there was a, there was a bookstore. I grew up in LA and there was a bookstore off the freeway called the change of Hobbit. And it was sort of the only place that you could go to get science fiction or fantasy. And, you know, I'd go there and get like star log magazine, which I loved. And, um, that's where I discovered Heinlein, um, Asimov. Um, I've read some Philip K. Dick, but I, I can't, you know, other than Blade Runner, I can't pretend to really be an aficionado. Um, and it, I, I like every year I get to go on like a vacation sort of at the end of the year. It's the only time I get off in the year. And, and I was trying to read at least one book. So maybe I'll do some Philip K. Dick this, this Christmas. Okay, cool. Um, I guess, I mean, I'm curious, just do you want to talk about like kind of what's going on with Star Trek now? I mean, there's the the Strange New Worlds show is just coming out and mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of Star Trek stuff going on. Is there just anything that you want to like point people to that, that you really want people to know about what's what's going on? Um, I think everyone is so in the know about what's going on. <laughs> We've been very open in sharing it. Um, you know, I, the reaction to Strange New Worlds has been incredibly gratifying to me and to everybody. And you know, that it really is a testament to the to the fans for being so vocal about wanting it in the first place. And I think we felt the responsibility to deliver what they wanted. And it feels like the reaction is clearly proven that we have and we just need to keep it up now. Um, it's funny because sometimes I think, you know, if the first Star Trek show we did was Strange New Worlds, people probably wouldn't have wanted it because they would have felt like, oh, we were just copying OG Star Trek. But I think given the last five years with all the different shows and all the different flavors of the shows, it, it feels fresh now to go back to OG Star Trek. And, um, and that's lovely. You know, that's really, really great. I, I think that what I love about the universe that we've built is that there's something for everybody. You know, one thing I know about Trekkers or Trekkies or however you want to self-identify is that no one is going to agree on everything right? The debate is part of what it means to be a fan of Star Trek. And there's often a division, right? There's like a 50, 50 split between people who love something and people who hate it. But that's what's that's that conversation is Star Trek. So I think that we have really tried to create a conversation with our shows 
and give, I feel like if we had tried to do one, one show that was a one size fits all show, it would have totally failed. You know, when you try and please everybody, you please nobody. So we really designed our shows to be targeted and tell very specific stories in very specific ways. And um, it feels like five years in now with, you know, the success of Strange New Worlds and the way it's been received, I feel like we've done a good first chapter in what Star Trek could become. Yeah, because I can remember, I mean, not that long ago, we were on this show, we were all lamenting that there was just no Star Trek show on TV and went to... Wouldn't it be great if there was if they would bring back Star Trek on TV and and now there's so many Star Trek shows. I even talked to my some of my friends who are hardcore Star Trek fans and I'm like I'll mention like Star Trek Prodigy and they're like wait wait there's there, I missed that one which what's what's that <laughs> one you know yeah yeah no I mean that's the beauty of it right like again there's something for everybody and um, I, I think there's I think the next phase of Star Trek has the potential to you know w- you want to take it to new and different places you don't want to just repeat yourself every time so. That's, that is, that is, we're beginning to turn into like, okay, you know, these shows have now settled into what they are and, and, and they've been really, really great to work on. So what's the next phase for everybody? And I think that's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's not a question that I want to answer too quickly because I actually think that as much as it seems like we're in a rush, we're not, you know, we just, they're just, as you know, there's so many people who love Star Trek so much that some really great ideas came along and and they were worthy of making, but we don't want to make Star Trek shows just to make them. We want to make them because there's a really great reason to make them and they have to be individualized and they have to be specific and they have to be special stories. Yeah, absolutely. So just to, to wrap things up, is there anything else you want to say about the man who fell to earth? If people haven't seen it just to, you know, just to persuade them that, that they got to check it out. I mean, I think given that our focus in this conversation is in, is on science fiction, I, I think the show is a different kind of science fiction in a, in a new and interesting way. You know, first and foremost, it's a, it's a show about a black family and representation in the world of science fiction has been extremely limited. And the fact that these characters, you know, Jenny and I talk about this all the time the show is a conversation about race, but the characters are not necessarily having a conversation about race. And that's actually something I learned from Gene Roddenberry because I think his, the greatest contribution he made to Star Trek was populating the bridge the way he did, but nobody ever talked about it. It was just a fact. It was just an assumption. And what he was really telling us is, can you envision a future in which these conversations and these divisions that exist between us now, that don't exist anymore. They're just assumptions you're going to have an incredibly diverse group of people and they're all going to be working together. And that's what it's going to be. And they're going to have much bigger problems. Like how do we save the universe as opposed to how do we keep focusing on what divides us? And that's a very special thing. So I think that ethos has been baked into man who felt the earth in a lot of ways. I also think that it's, it's an interesting combination of tones and that was very much by design because it's very emotional and it's very funny I think we, Jenny and I felt like comedy would in some ways be our secret weapon. It's hard to do all of those things in science fiction. And it's really hard to make it look seamless. But I know that as an audience member, I get excited when I see something that's trying to do something different. You know, that's sort of riffing on something that I love, but it's doing it in a new and different way. And that's really what we set out to do with The Man Who Fell to Earth. And I think it's really cathartic. I think it's talking about things that, are not just relevant now, they're, they're, what, they're going to determine the future of whether or not we're on this planet. But in a way that's really entertaining, you know, great science fiction makes you think about your place in the universe. That's the point. But it also entertains you and it allows you to go to different worlds and to envision things that you didn't even think were possible. And you get transported into a whole universe. And I think that's what the show does. I think that's what it does. And we were just trying to honor Tevis and Bowie and Nicholas Rogue and, and the amazing storytellers that came before us. But we also exist in a continuum of science fiction storytelling. And I want to believe that we can be at the vanguard of what science fiction is now and of what it will become. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I, I watched the first four episodes and I was just blown away by the by what happens toward the end of episode four. 
So I would definitely encourage everyone to to watch watch up to there and, and check that out. And yeah, and I'm definitely looking forward to to watching the rest of the season. Oh, thank you. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet because <laughs> there's a lot of crazy, crazy shit that's coming. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really curious to know what you think when you get to the end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I will definitely watch that. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, but it's we're all out of time, so we got to wrap things up there. Great. So we've been speaking with Alex Kurtzman about the new Showtime series, The Man Who Fell to Earth. So Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Alex Kurtzman for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.